to hit record. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen, give me just a moment here. And I'm gonna give you all a brief overview of the, um, the Global Warming Solutions Act and an introduction to the Vermont Climate Council. Erica gave us a quick overview, which was super helpful and allows me to go a little bit quicker here. Um, but wanna provide you all some context and information as to why you all are here today um, and are gonna work, work with us in this workshop to inform the development of the Climate Action Plan. So as Erica said, my name is Marion Wools. I am the Global Warming Solutions Act coordinator. Um, I work in service to the Vermont Climate Council and I'm a staff person at the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, so the Climate Action Plan, or excuse me, the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act was passed um, in late 2020, um, and it established uh, the requirements to develop a climate action plan through the establishment of a climate council. Um, and it required that uh, a climate council be set up by, um, I believe it was uh, November of 2020, um, which is a 23 member body made up of eight members from the administration, uh, seven men members appointed by the Senate and eight members appointed by the House. Um, that council uh, is charged with developing uh, a climate action plan, which addresses a number of requirements that you'll see here on the screen. One of which includes um, a greenhouse gas reduction requirements um, set forth for transportation building, utility, industrial, commercial, and agricultural sectors. In addition to those greenhouse gas reduction requirements, the Global Warming Solutions Act also lays out requirements for encouraging smart growth, achieving long-term sequestration and storage, uh, achieving net zero emissions by 2050, reducing energy burdens for rural and marginalized communities, limiting the use of chemicals and substances, um, and building and encouraging climate adaptation and resilience in Vermont's communities. Um, so there's a lot to cover here and a lot that we're working on in the development of the Climate Action Plan through the Climate Council. Um, and I'll walk through a bit what that makeup looks like and, and how that work has pr progressed thus far in the past 11 months. So um, as Erica noted, there, were, there are five subcommittees set up to do the bulk of the work under the Climate Council. Four of those were defined in statute and one was established um, after the Climate Council was set up. Right now, um, you're working uh, with many members of the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee who have put on this workshop for you all tonight. There's also an Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee, a Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee, and they are primarily focused on those greenhouse gas mitigation requirements. There's a Just Transition Subcommittee that's really focused in on equity and justice and a just transition to our new climate future. And then a Science and Data Subcommittee really focused on research and scientific reporting um, for the Climate Council and the Climate Action Plan. Um, the process that we used, have used to date um, has been similar across all of the subcommittees. Subcommittees have looked at and have inventoried existing programs that may help us meet our Global Warming Solutions Act requirements. Uh, subcommittees have identified and analyzed potential new strategies and programs that may help meet those requirements. And that's really the substance of what we hope to dig in with you all today. And then we'll be working on identifying and analyzing any financial strategies that are needed to support the implementation of the plan. We're looking at monitoring um, the strategies for implementation, especially after the Climate Action Plan is adopted on December 1st. And that will also inform rulemaking that will be taken on by the Agency of Natural Resources for those uh, greenhouse gas mitigation reduction requirements. All of that culminates in a plan that will be adopted by December 1st of this year. And this is a climate action plan that's updated every four years thereafter. So this isn't a once and done thing. We really see this as an iterative process to develop this plan, work with communities in Vermont to find the best ways to um, adapt our climate goals. Um, I do just wanna put up the slide here. Um, I mentioned that the Global Warming Solutions Act identified greenhouse gas reduction requirements. Um, these were targets that were laid out years ago for Vermont. Um, and the Global Warming Solutions Act um, transformed those into requirements that the state is required to meet. And you'll see those up here on the screen laid out for the 2025, 2030, and 2050 timeframes, as well as a requirement to be net zero um, emissions across all sectors by 2050 as well. So I do wanna lay that out as that's, that's certainly sort of the hardest, um, strictest Remember element of that Global Warming Solutions Act, but there are mitigation, or excuse me, adaptation and resilience um, goals in the act as well that um, this subcommittee especially is really hoping to focus on um, and advance as we work towards the development of this plan. Uh, one thing I do wanna note is um, through this process, we've really been focusing as on equity as a core component of the climate action plan and the work of the subcommittees. Um, the Just Transition Subcommittee has really been focused on this and has developed a fantastic um, guiding principles document and rubric that really details out how the Climate Council in Vermont as a whole can work towards a more just transition um, for climate change and for the solutions that we need to look at. 
Um, I put the uh, the definitions of um, uh, excuse me uh, the guiding principles um, recommendation here up on the screen for you all to review. And then within that document, uh, the Just Transition Subcommittee, and this has since been adopted by the Vermont Climate Council, um, put, to, put forth six guiding principles, um, which include inclusive, transparent, and innovative engagement, accountable and restorative justice, moving at the speed of trust, solidarity, um, ensuring that the most impacted are placed first, and supporting workers, families, and communities. And we really see this as fundamental to the work that all of the subcommittees are doing. Um, as we work on developing strategies and actions for the climate action plan, which is really what we're at the point of the process we are at right now, we are um, uh, evaluating actions um, across five elements. And those are, uh, you'll see on the pinwheel on the left here, which are informing those resilience and adaptation, mitigation and sequestration strategies that will all be components of the climate action plan. We're gonna be talking a lot about um, resilience and adaptation strategies with you all today. Um, sequestration strategies um, are going to be discussed at a forestry event. And if you're interested, this uh, saved on our website, you folks are welcome to join. And mitigation strategies as well, something we'll be talking about with you all. I do just want to differentiate that um, when we talk about mitigation strategies, it's a little different than what we say uh, when we mean hazard mitigation. This is really uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and those are the requirements that are set forth in the Global Warming Solutions Act. And that is all I have. So at this point, I will um, take my screen down and turn it over to Ted Brady, who's going to give us an introduction and some examples on uh, best practices for um, uh, municipal capacity building um, within municipalities when it comes to resilience and adaptation. So Ted, I will turn it over to you. We're happy to have you here today. Um, if you could provide an introduction and I will get your slides pulled up. I sure can. Uh, thank you, Marion. And also thank you to Director Bornman for leading us through this uh, journey. Uh, so I am Ted Brady. I am the executive director of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And uh, a quick primer for those that don't know the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, we are a membership organization that represents every single city and uh, town here in Vermont, all 246 cities and towns. And then uh, another 142 units of government, things like villages, things like county governments, uh, things like uh, fire districts along those lines. If you could take me to the next slide, please. That would be fantastic. Uh, our main goal is to uh, help. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that was founded uh, you know, 60 years ago with the mission of serving and strengthening local government. We do that in five key ways. Uh, we provide support to those governments. Uh, we provide uh, knowledge through training and, and seminars. Uh, we provide representation through advocacy. Uh, many of you on the uh, rural resiliency uh, subcommittee have uh, noticed Karen Horn uh, is hanging out with you, our, our lead advocacy, director of advocacy for the league. Uh, we provide insurance to our municipalities, another area where we intersect with climate change and where uh, we worry on a daily basis about the impact that climate change has on our insurance portfolio. And we provide connection to our municipalities through uh, networking opportunities for select board members to connect with one another. If you could take me to the next slide, please. Uh, Net, the, the big way we do networking, uh, one of the big events is town fair. I just wanna highlight this. Uh, our annual meeting is coming up September 29th in person and October 4th through 8th in uh, virtual. Great opportunity to learn uh, a little about uh, what, what VLCT does, but also a great learning opportunity for select board members, clerks, planning commission members, energy committee members, you name it. Now, why am I here tonight? As uh, Marion just mentioned, uh, it's because we want to provide some examples of how local government can help, uh, can be a key, uh, a key deliverer of, of some rural resiliency measures. And I always say that local government is often put in this position for one of two reasons. Uh, reason one, which is one that local government doesn't really like, is because the state tells them they have to do something. And sometimes that comes with money and sometimes that doesn't. Uh, option two, and this is happening more and more often across uh, the country, is that local government is stepping in, stepping in to do something that state and federal government has been unable to do, either because of ideological divide, uh, because of a lack of resources, in some instances, because of a lack of creativity. And so tonight I wanted to highlight uh, three of those great examples. I'm also here tonight partially because, uh, if you can take me to the next slide, there's a new resource in town. Uh, and that's that for the first time in 40 years, 
Local governments have money, discretionary money. Uh, thanks to our congressional delegation, Vermont communities have just received half of their $200 million in local fiscal recovery funds. What does that have to do with tonight? Well, one thing that these towns could use their funding on uh, in many different areas is climate resiliency. And so as we go through three examples of places where communities have undertaken this work in large part because they have chosen to, uh, I wanted to remind the communities on the phone and also those advocating for communities to do thing, things that there is this new money uh, in the pockets of municipalities now and they're trying to decide how to use it. And we here at the league think that this money should really kind of hit this sweet spot where we balance um, good governance, engaging people like you on this phone call, on this virtual meeting, into the process to talk about how this funding should be used, a good public process. Uh, two is we want to leverage at ARPA aid. Municipalities are getting $200 million. Well, the state's getting more than, uh, you know, a billion dollars in flexible money for this similar purpose. Try to pull some of that money down for your community by doing really innovative and interesting th things. And three, long-term recovery. There is nothing more long-term than combating uh, the scourge of climate change on our communities. So if you have questions and want to learn more about this, check out vlct.org backslash ARPA. Uh, and also if you have questions specific to this, we have a great ARPA director by the name of Katie Buckley, our former commissioner of housing and community development here in Vermont. Uh, you can email her at arpa at vlct.org. So, I want to give a, three quick examples of ways that towns historically have done this and, and have taken on climate resiliency. And uh, perhaps one of the greatest examples really goes back four decades now. It goes back to the Mad River Valley and the formation of the Mad River Valley uh, Planning District. Uh, some of you may know this, but this is an independent group outside of the typical uh, regional planning organizations, although the regional planning organizations are involved in the Mad River Valley Planning District. And the towns of Fayston, Wadesfield, Warren, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission came together to form this group in 1985. Uh, and you know they came together because they had uh, common issues in that Mad River Valley. It's managed by, a, it's governed by a steering committee made up of select board members and planning commission members from uh, each of these three towns, as well as business representatives from the Mad River Valley and Sugarbush. Uh, you can imagine that one of the reasons this place, that this organization formed is because of some of the natural tensions that occurred uh, when Sugarbush and Mad River Glen started uh, business in the valley. And as things escalated, things became unsustainable and they wanted to come together and find a way to undertake uh, so, some community improvements that would make their community more sustainable. Since then, they have a great executive director, Josh Schwartz, who if uh, you don't know him, you should get to know him, a great, wonderful guy. Uh, and they have a community planner and they've done kind of four key, um, uh, is three key uh, issues. Issue one, flood resilience, dealt with flood resilience, uh, flood resiliency issues in the valley. Following tropical storm Irene, the Mad River uh, Valley Planning District has been at the heart of chasing down FEMA money, chasing down community development block grants, chasing down ways to make all of their communities more resilient so that uh, the next time uh, Irene or an Irene-like event happens, their communities are more resilient. They've also partnered with, uh, they've also focused on energy, that's second issue. And they partnered with Efficiency Vermont, which some other communities in Vermont have done to become a targeted community. And that meant that their towns, their businesses received enhancements from Efficiency Vermont. So where you might normally get X dollars to do um, an energy efficiency upgrade in your building, you managed to get 2X because they were this targeted community. And that was in a large part thanks to the Mad River uh, Valley Planning District and this collaboration coming together. And they've also been doing this natural communities work. Like I said before, uh, when the Skirias came in, uh, you know, it created a, an imbalance with the community members. And the community members, including the Skirias, came together. To, to try to balance outdoor, sustainable outdoor recreation and economic development with the needs of the natural environment. Uh, they're key in providing municipal planning support to these towns as well. So that's uh, one example, a really structured long historical partnership that has done some of this work in these communities. If you could take me to the next slide, please. Uh, 
Another example that I think many people who have driven down Route 7 have seen this firsthand in Brandon. Uh, it has been particularly hard hit, and their economic center has been particularly bar hard hit by the impacts of climate change. They have experienced flooding for decades, if not a century, with the Neshobe River overflowing its riverbanks every once in a while. That's become more common. And post Irene, during uh, Tropical Storm Irene and the flood before, uh, Brandon uh, had more than two dozen business properties located in the flood erosion hazard area. 26 businesses sustained damage due to Irene. US 7 that runs through downtown Brandon was closed for several days to Irene flooding. That was before the big dig and the construction project that made it feel like it was closed for quite some time. But all that's related because after Irene with the help of an economic development authority grant, uh, sorry, uh, economic development administration grant, a team of staff from the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, kudos to Josh Hanford and his team, the local regional planning commission uh, and consultants uh, conducted a vulnerability assessment through the Vermont Economic Resiliency Initiative. And through that, they used several tools and community input events. They assessed Brandon's risk and provided a report with steps the community could take. Well, here we are, uh, you know, uh, a decade later, and those reports turned into recommendations that turned into actual projects. They include the designing and the building of an overflow culvert to protect the downtown municipal offices and businesses from floods and to ensure Route 7 remains open. And they've done several home and business buyouts. They've built some nice pocket parks that you should check out and some floodplain restoration projects along the Neshobe. It's really a great example of success in combating the impacts of climate change and be making a more resilient community. My last slide goes all the way south to Brattleboro. I think we all heard about the Tri-Park Mobile Home uh, Tri Park Mobile Home Park uh, down in Brattleboro when the, I believe it was the Whetstone Brook uh, that after Irene or during Irene created havoc on this community and put a lot of people out of their homes. Well, the town of Brattleboro has been key in helping to preserve the affordable housing that was uh, made possible by this park. It's the oldest mobile home park cooperative in the state. It comprises three separate mobile home parks. And to give you an idea, it had 264 occupied housing sites. Um, it, it's just an enormous place and really important for affordable housing down there. Uh, everybody from clerks, cashiers, janitors, medical assistants, town employees, you name it. This is the hub of workforce housing. And it's also a home to a lot of fixed income uh, folks, including seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, as I said, it sits along the Whetstone Brook and they lost 20 homes from Tropical Storm Irene. 42 homes in the park reside in the special flood hazard area. In 2018, the park with assistance from Brattleboro, Brattleboro uh, developed a master plan that lays out how to adopt the pack, park to climate change risks while still providing the necessary housing. The plan was published in early 2020 and lays out existing conditions, a relocation strategy, and a list of priority actions. Every, uh, all this work is still very much in progress, but it's a great, partnership between the town and the park and affordable housing providers down there to create a more resilient housing stock. My closing thoughts on uh, the topic. As I said before, towns find themselves combating climate change usually for one of two reasons, because they're either told to and they have to, or because they opt to, because nobody else is doing it. And I think these are some good examples of towns that stepped up to the challenge because they had really active citizens in their communities, they had active energy committees, they have uh, active planning commissions, active select boards that said, we're going to undertake this work, we're gonna find the resources and we're gonna make our communities more resilient. I hope these gave you some ideas for tonight's brainstorming sessions and for tonight's breakout sessions. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Ted. And I think at this point, we'll turn to Catherine for a presentation of the work that the subcommittee has taken on thus far and what we'll be looking at for folks uh, for conversation later tonight. Thanks, Marian. Thanks, Ted, for that great overview of what our communities in Vermont are already doing. So as Erica mentioned, um, she and I co-chair the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee. And I see many members of our committee in this meeting tonight, and thank you for being here. 
what I'm going to do is just give an overview of some of the work that we've that we've completed to date. We're going to share with you some of the ideas that we have about achieving Vermont's climate goals, specifically related to rural communities and adaptation and resilience. But I want you to know as we talk about this, that this is the beginning of our work. What I'm sharing with you are the ideas we have now. And what we're really hoping to get out of this meeting is your ideas, your feedback, your questions, so that we can make sure that what we present um, to be included in the Climate Action Plan is really reflective of the needs of rural communities. That's especially important to me. I was appointed specifically to represent rural communities on the Vermont Climate Council. So if at any time after this meeting you have ideas or questions, I want you to feel free to contact me and my contact information, I think is on the Vermont Climate Council website, or you can just Google my name and it will come up somewhere. <laughs> So the charge of the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee is to really focus on the climate change adaptation pressures that our communities will feel and to focus on how we can be resilient. And then especially we are supposed to focus on the needs of rural communities and the special challenges they have. The impacts on Vermont um, from climate change are obvious to everybody and the increased water we see in storms the frequency of storms, the size of storms, and we're not gonna talk a lot about that tonight. You all know it, you see it in your communities. And it's with that backdrop that we've really thought about how we're gonna move forward to address this climate challenge. <clears throat> so the overall goal of the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee is to make sure that Vermont's people, communities and ecosystems are prepared for and resilient to the impacts of climate change. And in terms of the definitions that we're working under, Marion mentioned the different use of the term mitigation in the context of the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I just wanna talk about adaptation and resilience. So uh, when we talk about adaptation, we're really talking about how we reduce vulnerability to the impacts of climate change. And when we talk about resilience, we're really talking about building the ability to withstand and recover from the impacts of climate change, including the climate events that we have with our increased storms. So as in order to achieve these goals, we have identified five pathways. And what I'm gonna do is just give a very brief overview of each of those pathways and provide a couple of examples of strategies or actions that we've thought about so far uh, to help us achieve this pathway. So the first is really focused on capacity. Ted mentioned municipalities do things because they have to or they want to, and sometimes there are resources and sometimes there are not. Well, we want to make sure that there is capacity to do what needs to be done. Climate change and adaptation and resilience is a huge lift, and there are needed resources both for our communities, both in our formal structure, in our government, and in our own informal structures, in civic networks and volunteer groups. And so we have um, established this as a key pathway that we wanna make sure there's capacity to actually do this work. A couple of examples that we've talked about are establishing permanent support for local and regional resilience. One idea there is for a permanent position in the regional planning commissions to be available to work with communities and implement what needs to happen. And then another is to provide tools and resources so communities can really assess their own climate vulnerabilities and help prioritize the changes that need to happen. Our second pathway is really focused on infrastructure. And this is a very big topic handled under one pathway, but really our goal is to proactively invest to ensure that transportation, communication, water, wastewater, energy, all the infrastructure that we need to succeed, both economically and culturally, are protected from the impacts of climate change. Some examples of those are to um, create a framework to identify and evaluate the threats to energy and communication systems serving the rural communities. And another is to really focus on identifying the specific changes that need to happen to make sure our critical infrastructure can withstand impacts. That includes reducing vulnerabilities of specific facilities, as well as looking at things from a system perspective. So not only just looking at a bridge and whether that needs some improvements, but looking at the whole corridor of a roadway and how that's going to continue to function in the new world of our climate impacts. 
Pathway three is related to fossil fuel use. Our committee is specifically charged with um, putting together equitable best practices that address the unique challenges of rural communities when it comes to reducing fossil fuel use. A couple of the ideas related to this that we've talked about are making sure that we do that, identify and sharing these best practices. And an example of what one thing that could happen is to really expand access to programs that provide no upfront costs for weatherization for landlords and homeowners. This is one area we're really hoping to hear some great ideas from you about as we move into our breakout session. So I, we, we, we are excited to hear from you. <clears throat> Pathway four is related to land use. Our committee and um, everyone involved in climate change work recognizes that land use patterns, our current land use patterns and our future land use patterns have a huge impact on our ability to re be resilient to and adapt to climate change, as well as our capacity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So in this pathway, we're really aiming for Vermont current and future development to be resilient and adaptive. And we wanna promote compact development as well as support our natural and working landscape and recognize the um, vitality of our rural areas and how they contribute to our state. Some examples of these are to First, it really improved coordination among agencies, departments, commissions, et cetera, to ensure that climate change impacts are considered in permitting decisions. Uh, there's been ideas to create a land use plan statewide, that may sound familiar to some people, uh, that would really help us guide development into the areas that are um, where we have infrastructure, where we can be resilient, and to make sure that rural development is done in in areas that are outside of our ecologically sensitive and risk prone areas. And then a specific action we could do is to establish a statewide conservation and buyout program for at risk properties. One of the exciting things about the COVID relief funds is that Vermont is already moving forward on this last bullet and establishing a state program. Enabling that to continue when these federal dollars go away is something we really wanna focus on. And finally, pathway five is related to housing. Our communities recognize that without stable housing, communities can't survive economically. They can't thrive. Citizens can't think about being resilient to climate change if housing is a constant worry. So housing, we thought was a very important part of being resilient and adaptive and impacts both rural and urban areas of our state. It's important that we have safe, affordable, and location and energy efficient housing. Some examples of strategies and actions is to really support networks of builders that can help and have expertise in building small homes and accessory units to take advantage of our existing housing stock to serve our, our changing dynamics, our changing households. This is just one area where we've looked at and recognized that there's some real job growth opportunities in Vermont when we look at climate change and what we need to do um, to both adapt and be resilient to its impacts. Another action is to create a rental registry and inspection program. And finally, making sure we are focused on uh, those among us who for one reason or another do not have a place that they can call home. So that is it in a nutshell. Those are our five pathways that we have talked about and some samples of actions that um, we have discussed. And I hope that that gives you some ideas of where we've started our work and where we'd love to hear from you to build on that or to challenge that or to give us your ideas or questions. And now I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Morris, who will talk about the breakout groups. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen um, to introduce um, our, our next hour, um, where this is really the, the time that we want to hear from you. You've the, really the beginning of this meeting has been to um, share just the inf background information, context setting information, so that everybody understands uh, the work of the Rural Resilience Subcommittee and the Climate Action Council. So, and the Climate Council and and where they're headed. Uh, to give you some ideas of what's already 
been happening and some opportunities for both funding and um, other uh, changes in, in, the, in the state that will allow you to take on some of these challenges. But now we want to turn it over to you and hear your feedback on some of the ideas that the Rural Resilience Subcommittee has been thinking about and shared with you. But thinking beyond that to questions of what kinds of challenges you are personally facing in the towns and communities that you're living in, what capacities that you need or resources that you need in order to take on some of those challenges and what you're looking to, for the state to help you with. Um, so this is an opportunity to be talking to um, the state directly and, and give them your feedback. You've heard um, a lot about some of the innovative things that have been happening. We're looking for you to share with us also some of the successes in your own towns and some of the things that, that you've seen working. Um, and this will be information that we're going to be, that the Rural Resilience Subcommittee will be taking back uh, and considering as they continue to really develop their action, actions and along these pathways in more detail. Um, the three questions that we're gonna ask you to take on in these smaller groups are basically, uh, what again, what are, the, what are some of the challenges you're facing, the greatest opportunities, and what kind of capacities or resources do you need to, to be successful in achieving the, these, meeting these challenges? Um, Three areas are greenhouse gas emission reductions to meet the overall state goals, uh, the um, obviously the resilience and adaptation challenges you might be facing in your community. So we are going to send you off into these breakout groups. We were gonna randomly assign you so that we have an even number in each group. You'll have a facilitator in each group as well as a note taker who will be sure to be capturing your ideas. Ultimately, we're going to be producing an overall summary of these conversations in the breakout groups and making that public to everybody, but also sharing that obviously with all of the, the, the uh, Climate Council members. When we come back from the breakout, we'll have a full hour, uh, but when we come back, we're gonna ask the facilitators of each group to just hit some high points, some, some surprising elements that they heard, some things that they were hearing that seemed to resonate with everybody in their group, um, some themes that came through. Uh, we don't have a lot of time because we want to really want to spend most of our time in these groups listening to you. Um, so we're just going to really, it's not meant to be a comprehensive report out, it's just meant to be a flavor of what was happening in the group. Um, happy to if people have any, any specific questions. Um, I think most of that can be answered in your breakout group. So if we're ready, um, I think we can send you off and we'll meet, you, meet back here in an hour. So I'm going to give it a, we've got about 45 people coming back in, 46 for a few more come joining us. Um, I need to get my list of facilitators here and see if we've got some volunteers to go first. I'll give you a minute as you're think, gathering your thoughts. But as I said, um, when I, before we went to breakouts, um, no way we can capture an hour of discussion in, in reporting out. So we wanted to, but we did want to be sure that we gave um, gave each of the groups a chance to share with the rest of the participants some of the, you know, the, the, the ideas that were uh, percolating in your particular discussion um, and see, it'd be interesting to see if there's some overlap in what rose to the top. Um, and uh, I, so I've asked the facilitators just to, to try to take a shot at that. And, and again, apologies if, if we don't all capture, me being one of them, don't all ca capture the the full flavor of all of these group breakouts because I know there was some great discussion in every one of them. So um, can I call on um, one of the facilitators that to go first? I can go ahead, Catherine. Great, Marion. Thanks. Helpful to kick us off. Um, 
Hi, everyone. So we had a fantastic discussion in our breakout room. Um, a lot of really um, uh, interesting folks engaged in their communities across the state on climate change issues and, and energy issues. Um, we started by talking about um, greenhouse gas mitigation and sort of the steps and opportunities that municipalities can take and the challenges that they face um, in terms of implementing, you know, changes and, and programs needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we had a lot of discussion around um, sort of the reality around Vermont being a small state and our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions are sort of just a drop in the bucket when we think about global emissions, um, but that it is still important that we take those steps to reduce our emissions, but also the reality that even if we were to go to net zero tomorrow, we would still feel the impact of climate change in terms of flooding and drought and, and other severe weather impacts as well as impacts to our economy and, and all, all sorts of other things. So that it's really important that we focus on adaptation and resilience um, in addition to those greenhouse gas mitigation requirements. A um, lot of interesting discussion. And one thing that was really highlighted for me as I've heard this quite a bit um, was discussion around um, electric vehicle incentives for municipal fleets. Um, so when municipalities are looking to sort of change over their vehicles, um, you know, we, we hear about incentives for, um, for individuals, for private citizens in Vermont through a number of, of uh, mechanisms, as well as for low income uh, folks, um, but I haven't heard of anything for municipalities and, and so that came up as an interesting idea. Um, also a lot of uh, support for um, an existing program called the Window Dressers Project. Um, I recommend you all take a look at it and look it up if you haven't uh, heard of it. Um, a lot of folks on our, our call um, had heard of it or had had it in their communities, and it's a, 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 a place where folks, the community comes together to um, build these inserts that go into windows um, that help reduce the, uh, the, the thermal energy needs of buildings, um, and it really is sort of a community building effort. Um, and then thinking as our discussion migrated to adaptation and resilience, um, a lot of discussion around um, the need for sort of neighborhood hubs or adaptation teams at the local level that help to implement projects and share information about resources that's really community driven. And we had a lot of discussion around how um, trying to get uh, and make rural communities um, livable places where folks want to want to move and want to live, but also trying to harness um, uh, you know, economic development and, and social capital and, and fiscal capital for um, shops and restaurants and grocery stores so that folks don't have to travel as much and can actually reduce their emissions. And I think that's a really interesting piece of, of our conversation. I think a conversation at large as, as we're in, in a pandemic and many folks are, are um, some folks are working from home and, and starting to see their communities at different times of day. So that was a really interesting conversation um, that's only a small part of what we talked about, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Um, Jens or, or Joe, you want to go next? Um, sure. Our, our group, we had a fantastic group with quite a diversity of towns from the uh, from some of the largest towns in Vermont uh, to some of the smallest. Um, and I want to pick up on, on three points. Uh, the first is, is transportation and the challenges that rural communities uh, have around transportation. The need for increased infrastructure in our transportation network to accommodate uh, big vehicles, to, uh, to get some of the larger trucks out of the, the uh, village centers in our, in our rural communities, um, and also the need for public transportation. Uh, and, and that infrastructure needs to be in place in our rural communities. And it's challenging um, because there isn't the, the, the number of people to warrant that sort of uh, public transport. The second is the need for broadband. And we connected that to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and transportation, uh, but uh, really across the board, how that could uh, build capacity in our rural communities. And then the third is, is we talked a lot about volunteerism and what, what makes a, uh, what, you know, the example was some of the, uh, in, in one of our rural communities, the fire department is a, is a real bustle of activity. Why? What's so exciting about, uh, about the fire department in that community? And we talked about volunteerism, both in terms of the, the need for marketing to really get the word out there that we need young people on these committees and we need them to serve. Uh, and also the need for training and that we need the right people in these jobs because in these volunteer jobs, because we're, we're throwing so much at the rural communities. And so there's a, a wide range of training opportunities out there for volunteers and just how important that is. I'll turn it back over to you. And you did a great job, Jens, of, of 
get, taking us one, two, and three. And I forgot to say at the beginning, if folks want to register your enthusiasm for uh, particular things that you're hearing, or if you want to register that you'd like to know more about a particular thing, again, you can use the chat function. And, and this is something that we will be able to take to save and just it indicates to us whether there's a level of, of it, again, enthusiasm for particular ideas or interest in pushing other ideas forward. So feel please feel free to use the chat. Just give us some indication of what, which idea you're, you're referring to. Um, so Joe, I'll let you go next. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I had a great group uh, too, of course. And, you know, it was a good mix of folks from on uh, uh, energy committees, planning commissions, uh, you know, emergency management, regional planning commissions. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say the one cross-cutting issue over the, the three topics of adaptation, resilience, and GHG reduction was land use. Um, and, you know, it connected all of those. And it's interesting, great to hear Jens talk about transportation because now I can talk about biodiversity. And one of the, uh, <laughs> one of, um, you know, the issues with land use is just thinking about, you know, how to, how to protect the biodiversity, particularly of like core forest in, in rural communities. Um, and, and thinking that, you know, that's actually a really critical a aspect of being resilient and, and at adapting. Um, and, and so you can call that number one if you'd like. Number two is, is still related. Um, it kind of builds off that, but it's, it's the idea, it builds off land use, but, but rather than thinking just about compact settlements in Vermont, also um, communities that are self-sufficient, you know, in the lo localization of services and food, food systems. And if you think about it, that, you know, just that reduces the need to travel. Um, it keeps the money flowing locally. Um, it just makes us more resilient. And I, and I think it's even, you know, you think about that localization and even kind of affects maybe, you know, the utility industry, for example, microgrids came up, you know, so if you're sort of self-sufficient on a microgrid level, you're just more resilient. Um, so I, I, the self-sufficiency thing really kind of rang a bell for me and I thought it was really um, fascinating. Um, and then I'll say the third thing, it has to do with capacity of, of local governments and local communities to get things done was just the idea of pooling resources amongst maybe two or three communities, sort of like what they did in the Mad River Valley. But, um, you know, the mod, that's a good model, but it can be applied to other things besides planning, like it, it could apply to implementing transportation improvements or, you know, maybe making uh, improvements on a watershed scale because what happens upstream affects what happens downstream. So just, smaller groups, you know, not necessarily region-wide, but uh, a few communities working together. Great, appreciate that. And um, I'll, I'll take the last group, uh, which was actually group number one, but um, I thought that um, we actually had a theme that ran through all three of our groups as well, which was the issue of education and communication. I heard um, a lot of real um, concern that, you know, it's, it's great that we have a few communities that are moving ahead with, with doing some things, but not everybody has the resources to know either how to identify what should be done, much less know how to, how to implement it. So that there is a role here for um, perhaps the state perhaps the RPCs, but there's, there's a role for providing um, that, that education and, and outreach. And that actually um, brought up the issue of broadband uh, infrastructure and how that's one mechanism for getting the information out that people need um, that has to be addressed first. So it kind of connected the whole issue of, uh, I think we started out when we were talking about greenhouse gas mitigation about how better communication is needed to be able to identify where the greatest opportunities for reductions are. Uh, and broadband is key to that. Uh, we had uh, also throughout our conversations, a discussion about where the uh, impetus should come for, for making major changes and big decisions about investment. And there was really a, a pretty, um, diverse set of opinions. And, and ultimately, I think the what I heard is the final message is it has to come from all levels. It has to be both a top down, as well as a bottom up or a push and pull, as somebody said, 
um, where if it's, if, you know, there is benefits from hearing from the students at UMV that, you know, they're looking for change and they want the administration to, to make some changes um, and they're providing some of that push. Um, and then there's also benefit for having the state some, in some cases set some benchmarks or some floors for what is expected and needed to happen at the local level just to get things moving and then allowing the local governments to go beyond that. Uh, that said, there was also some, some support for the idea that watersheds sort of could be play a significant role. Um, and there's already some examples where watershed councils are, will be set up to be able to try to prioritize some of the investments that are coming down the pike for water quality. Um, and then we heard some great examples of towns that were already taking initiative on their own to try to change their bylaws, uh, to do things like implement new uh, conservation overlays or zero stormwater discharge um, regulations for new developments or river corridor protection um, uh, uh, guidance and, and mandates. Um, so, Again, it's happening at all levels and we probably need it to continue to happen at all levels and uh, for this to, to work. Um, because the other issue that we heard a lot about was um, both the need to, you know, the urgency and how to speed up the process, how we need to be speeding up the process and prioritizing the places where we can have the biggest impact. I'm not sure we had all the answers to that, um, but I think there's a recognition that um, while there's an urgency taking the time to understand how to prioritize may actually take more time. Um, so there's this, sort of this, this tension that we heard about there. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and I guess we're ready to turn it back because we're right at the top of the hour, turn it back to Miriam for our next steps. Great, so uh, thanks everyone again for joining us. I'm gonna very quickly go over a couple of next steps and then we'll turn you all loose for the rest of your evening. Um, uh, I wanna just highlight, so thank you so much for the feedback and information and ideas you all provided in this event. Um, as, as you all know, in each of the rooms, we had note takers um, and we've also recorded this larger uh, report back. That information is gonna feed back direct, directly into the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee. And they'll be using that to develop the action that they propose for the Climate Action Plan. Um, they'll be presenting those initial set uh, at the end of the month to the Vermont Climate Council, and then a second iteration of those at the end of October. Um, a couple of different ways um, that we, we can have you all engage in this process. First, I just wanna say that the Climate Council and all of its subcommittees, it's a public process. And so all of the meetings, and I'll post the uh, link to how to get involved, which has a link to our calendar, um, is in uh, on our new website. Um, they're all Zoom meetings, so you can join remotely as a member of the public and offer comment. Um, and we welcome your engagement and have welcomed the engagement of the public all along in this process. And then I quickly want to share uh, my screen here just to highlight a couple of additional public engagement events that we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. We have four in-person outdoor public engagement events. You'll see them listed on the left side here um, that are taking place over the next couple of weeks. They're open to the public. We'll have food, childcare will be provided. We have uh, translation interpretation services if those are needed for you all. And these are going to be facilitated by a contractor that we have um, that's really working with us on public engagement and how to hear and hearing from the public and gathering information from the public on climate change. This event was really focused on rural communities and capacity issues at the municipal level. The four in-person events are gonna be sort of a broader focus of public engagement, but would definitely encourage you all to attend um, if you're interested in, in the area, we would love to have your feedback. We will also have three online events, um, two of which, um, uh, or excuse me, one of which is really a BIPOC, so um, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color affinity space that we're really hoping to open up um, for those folks in the BIPOC community to engage with us on the Climate Action Plan, and then two additional online events if you aren't able to make any of the in-person events. I posted the link in the chat and you can see it on the slide here. Um, we have a new website. Um, you can find the links to register for those events and Zoom links for any of our public events, both the Climate Council subcommittee and our public engagement events um, on our calendar on the website. And then lastly, just a couple of takeaways. Again, this climate action plan, um, we're working fast. It's going to be adopted on December 1st. Um, I did just wanna re-highlight that um, the, the Climate Council is really a group of multi-stakeholders and this is going to be a multi-stakeholder plan. So we're really excited to hear your voices and your perspectives from all levels of government and all levels of society. Um, and that's gonna feed into this plan. 
acknowledging that significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will be needed. We've highlighted this quite a bunch, but that it's really important to balance those with the adap uh, adaptation, resilience, and then carbon sequestration efforts as well. So I'll stop there. I just want to turn it back quickly to Catherine Dimitrik and Erica Borneman, if you all have any closing remarks, and then we will uh, end for the evening. I just want to express my appreciation to everyone for taking a couple of hours out of your busy schedules to, to share your thoughts and your ideas with us and encourage you to stay involved. We really appreciate hearing more as the process unfolds. So thank you all very much. Yes, and I'll say ditto and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.